Hi everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Um, it's not. It's only for recording. It's not for actually. So I have to speak out loud because this is only for the recording. Uh, can you all hear me? Good. Perfect. Thank you all for coming and good morning. I know it's early for all of us, <laughs> but we're very happy. We do. We've been up for hours. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Gabriela Ishten. I work for Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, so WILP Sweden, and I'm also a part of FUF. Uh, sit, um, I sit at the, in the board of FUF. Uh, what's FUF in English? <laughs> exactly, thank you. <laughs> I should know that. Um, yeah, so today we have a, a great guest, Cynthia Enlo. Uh, who j yesterday arrived from London, but are uh, normally based in Boston at Clark's University, professor in feminist international theory. Uh, and is um, mostly known, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, mostly known for uh, gender and militarization studies or theories. So the plan is that we're going to pick your brain today. You're first going to start a little bit by you talking about your job or work, and then we're going to open up the floor and have a question and answer section. And we have to finish a little bit earlier uh, because Cynthia needs to go to another meeting at 10, so we have to maybe uh, 20 past 9, 25 past 9, we'll finish it off. Um, yes, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, more than that? Wired, so yes, so you don't need this. We're, we're doing the wiring back there. Hi, everybody. This is, this is great. So I just learned this used to be the entrance to a garage. <laughs> <laughs> what a waste that would have been. <laughs> really, this is fabulous. So when Aileen and uh, Gabriella, because um, I'm also part of WILP internationally, um, and um, so when they suggested having this conversation, I thought, oh, God, how great. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, yes, I do, I do a lot of work on militarism. Um, and what I think of more as militarization. Um, I don't know how it would translate into Swedish. But the difference for me is that the militarization is about the process by which any one of us or any organization becomes militarized. And I'm really interested in that process. This, it's usually step by little step. It's not like on Monday you're not militarized and by Tuesday afternoon you're thoroughly militarized. And that can happen. But it usually is very incremental. And it happens to your organization slowly. It happens to the um, governments that you're working with or the people that you're working with. Um, in development work, um, it can happen very slowly, and it's the process. It can happen in a lot of different ways, um, and I try. I actually, in my own work, I actually try to be more reflective on how I've become militarized, or when I was on the brink of being militarized, and then usually somebody else. I wasn't smart enough. Somebody else said, "Cynthia, do you really want to do that?" Um, do you really want to become part of that? Is that really what you think? Do you realize what slippery slope you're on? And usually it takes somebody like that to think, oh, my God, I didn't realize. I, I was just about to kind of join the parade, if you will. Um, so to become militarized means that you, well, it can happen a lot of different ways, but it, it really means that you are likely to begin to do things or think things that elevate um, militaristic ideas and presumptions. So for me, amongst the most militarized ideas, and it's usually, militarism is a package, and we can kind of talk about this. Uh, um, it's, it's a multi-part package, and it includes a lot of ideas. And ideas that aren't so much what you're promoting, it's just what you think is natural. Or if you're working with people who are militarized, what they think is natural. For instance, they think it's natural to imagine that the world is a dangerous place. Now that may seem very reasonable, 
And anybody who doesn't think that, you think is a bit crazy. Um, but it's a building block for the next militarized idea. And one idea doesn't make you a militarist. <laughs> it just means you're kind of more open to the next idea, which makes you more amenable to the next idea. And by the sixth idea, you're ready to do things that you didn't think you would really go along with. So the next idea that usually goes along with the world is a dangerous place is that it's natural to have enemies. That that's, I mean, that's just part of being a human is that you have enemies. That, now that's a really, I think that's a really dangerous belief to take on. But for a lot of people, it seems quite normal. It doesn't seem terrible. It doesn't seem ideological. It seems sensical. All right, and that's, I think, what makes it so insidious. Ideas that don't seem as if they're argumentative, they just seem as if, well, you're part of this 21st century world. Um, hey there, how you doing? No, 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 we're, you know, this is very informal. Um, and then, so the third idea that builds on this. So they are kind of building blocks, right? But if you think about it in an organization, because this is, institutions develop these ideas, not just people. People develop them, but institutions develop them as well. And so the third idea is to think, and maybe they're not exactly in the sequence, but that it is normal for any nation that's a state to have a military. And I'll give you an example when, uh, of why it's not normal. Because which countries don't have militaries? Costa Rica. Costa Rica and? <laughs> Iceland. Iceland, right? Now what's interesting is there have been a lot of new countries in the world in the last 80 years, right? One was Bangladesh, 1970s, 72. Right? Um, and there have been a lot of governments that have reformulated themselves in a radical kind of way, including Haiti, for instance. And when um, the dictator was, um, Baby Doc, was ousted in Haiti, there was a real conversation. This is now kind of back channel conversation. Some of it leaked out about whether the new Haiti would have a military. Because, of course, there was the Costa Rican model nearby. And so there was a discussion. The, the Haitian military had been so corrupted, so corrupting, and so oppressive, maybe it would be better for Haiti to have a professional police force. Now, you have to make sure it's democratic. But, but not have a military. Because who's going to invade Haiti? And the US development advisors said, no, no, if you're going to be a mature state, if you're going to be taken seriously, because watch, this is the slippery slope, if you're going to be taken seriously in the international system by the international community, which meant other states, didn't mean you all, <laughs> um, if you're going to be taken seriously in the international community, you have to have a military. Well, that's deadly. That kind of thinking, that you really have to be, to be taken seriously. That's the militarization of seriousness, all right? It's the militarization of what it means to be part of the international community. Um, and so, and then once you have a state military, a militarized idea is where you put it in public life. Where do you put it in the notion of citizenship? Where do you put it in civic values? All right. So you can have a military and try to keep it way off to the side of civic values. Not ostracized, because you have to keep it in. So for instance, today in Japan, that is the well, it's probably the most serious debate amongst Japanese ordinary citizens. And I've, when I've been in Tokyo, I have a lot of Japanese 
feminist friends. And when I've been in Tokyo, they, my feminist friends always take, to the dem take me to the demonstrations outside the parliament, which is called the Diet in Japan. They take me to these big demonstrations outside the Diet and um, against expanding the mission capacities of the Japanese Defense Force because that's creep, that's mission creep as they say. But the debate in Japan is really, are we becoming remilitarized? Abe, the Prime Minister, argues to Japanese citizens, many of whom are beginning to agree thanks to North Korea and China, so that's about the enemy bit, right? Not bit, big part, and say, Japan won't be taken seriously in the international system and will never get a seat on the Security Council unless it has a proper military. That's the militarization of the Security Council, which of course already is very militarized. I shouldn't say of course, we can talk about that, but <laughs> the, it's the most militarized part of the United Nations system is the Security Council. And Japan, the Japanese state has, has for years now wanted to have a seat um, on the secure, a permanent seat on the Security Council. And the argument of Abe et al. has been you'll never get a seat on the Security Council unless you have a proper military. So my interest has been to chart militarism, because you'll notice all these building boxes had nothing to do with gender so far. But I think they are deeply gendered. And it usually goes along with the idea of masculinity and men, which are not the same, masculinities and men. And with the presumption of, if you agree with all five of these, have I gotten up to five, six, of these ideas, then somebody's got to be a protector. In that kind of dangerous world where there are enemies, somebody has to be a protector of somebody. And the presumption is, widespread presumption is, that men who are manly, so you, you know, the proviso, right? Men who are properly manly should stand up and be protectors. Of whom? Of people who need protection, and who would they be? Women who are properly womenly. Women exactly, and children, right? Unless the child is a 16-year-old boy who under, you know this, under international law is a child, and if he is, the father has gone off to be a migrant worker in the mines or has been killed in war or died of AIDS, or, then that 16-year-old boy should stand up and be the protector of the household. And the debate in Britain right now is whether the, the Ministry of Defense, MOD, whether the Ministry of Defense can continue to recruit 16 and 17-year-old, quote, children. And so far they can. So the UK is way out of step, but the US doesn't recruit 16 and 17 year olds. You have to have parental permission, but you can bring them into cadet corps in, in secondary school. So this notion of the protector and manliness absolutely depends on somebody in society being feminized so that they're turned into the protected. And one of the things that is so um, insidious about the protector protected is that if you are the protector, however that's ideologically imagined, if you're the protector, of course you have to know about the world, right? Because how can you be a protector unless you know what's going on in the next village? Or whether you know who controls the region or, you know, um, whether you can take your goods to market. All kinds of things. You have to have knowledge to be a protector. But the protected is presumed not to need that knowledge. So all of a sudden, you've got the militarization and the masculinization of information, of who's supposed to listen to the news, if you're lucky enough to have a radio. 
who's supposed to be part of the wider world and who's supposed to be part of the very confined domestic world. So that the militarization of masculinity is accompanied by the militarization of femininity, but in quite different positions. So in the work that I do, I try to watch it at micro scales, as well as I'm very interested in foreign ministries, relationships to defense ministries in every country and the shifts that go on and who co-ops whom and so on. But I'm also interested in who controls the radio in a village household. Right. So for me, to understand the process of militarization means you've got to think gender. You can watch militarization. I have a lot of colleagues um, in security studies and all that sort of thing, um, and international politics, who watch militarization, but they have no gender analytical tools at all. And they just miss. They miss the kind of first three steps on the slippery slope. Well, I know slopes don't have steps. Oh, well. Um, you know, but, right? They miss it. Furthermore, they, have, they really have very little idea about how you demilitarize society or how you demilitarize a family or how you demilitarize a region because they do not know how to think in that granular gender way. But it's a skill. I mean, I wasn't trained. I went to University of California at Berkeley when it was supposedly radical, and, you know, and it was, I guess. But there was no gender analysis anywhere. There was no feminist curiosity at Berkeley when I was in Berkeley in the 60s, none. And so for me, it's all been very recent. And now I realize, my God, if you don't have those skills and you don't have the opportunity to learn those gender analytical skills, you really can't. You can't chart it and you can't reverse. You can't chart militarization, you can't reverse it. Not effectively and not for the long run. So I'm really happy to have you know, questions from Gabriella and also stories and questions and thoughts about what you get if you're at university, what you get and what you don't get, and what people make up for excuses for not having. Feminist analysis is part of your training and in the organizations you work with, what you run up against when people just don't, are not interested. It's really, it's important to chart the barriers. What do people sound like? Because they oftentimes can sound like they're being your mentor. <laughs> like, you don't really want to be interested in that. You, know, you won't get a job with that skill. Don't put that on your resume, <laughs> honestly. So. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm going to take some examples of uh, WILF uh, and what we oh, do and what we work with um, in Sweden particularly. And it's what we feel, so WILP is an anti-militaristic feminist uh, organization, a global one. Uh, and what we feel might be the biggest problem with when we work is this, what you're talking about, the proper tools of feminist analysis. Mm -hmm. That in Sweden today, pretty much everyone is, agrees that women women's rights are important and women need to be included in different fields, in development, gender analysis is important. But when you really go down to the deeper, when you a really use a feminist theory mm -hmm. to explain what you just explained, the different role and masculinity and femininity, then we, we re really often just, um, well, people roll their eyes and think that we're extreme. And the rolling of the eyes never gets into the committee minutes. <laughs> no, but this is really important. So when you look back on some organization and you think, why has it been so stubborn? In fact, the minutes will never show what was the patriarchal act, which was, you know, that never gets into the minutes. And yet it's damning, right? It closes conversations. And I think really for us, um, in um, 1325, the Women, Peace and Security agenda from the Security Council that I think most of you probably know of, um, I mean, it's such a sad but good example of how um, something that was brought uh, to actually increase 
gender equality mm -hmm. has now been militarized in the fact, and this conversation is very often in Sweden as well, has been that we add women to the military, oh. which is not the purpose of 1325. It was actually to, to uh, prevent conflict and prevent increase of military. How do you, for, for us that are in Sweden now discussing these issues, uh, how do you have any tips and tricks of how actually to deal with these issues, to not get the rolling of the eyes, mm. or to actually take, be taken serious when we want to take the discussion on a deeper level? Because we can't really change anything uh, by just adding women and stir. Yeah. We really need a feminist analysis. Do you have any tips well, and yeah, tricks? So do most of you know about, I mean, you have to be honest here. Is there anyone who couldn't talk for 30 seconds about 1325? Does anyone know what it is? I mean, truly? Because if, you know, this Maybe is not the moment quick. to pretend you know things when you don't know them, <laughs> right? All right. But 1325 was, is based on feminist analysis in the NGO sector, especially feminists who were working in WILP, in the New York office right across from the United Nations on First Avenue and... New York, um, feminists inside of UNHCR, inside the UN, U United Nations High Commission for Refugees, uh, feminists working inside of Oxfam, feminists working inside of the Swedish Development um, uh, Department. There was a, it was a whole growing coalition in the, it's very specific, in the 1990s. And particularly because of the wars in the former Yugoslavia um, and um, then belatedly an understanding of how misogynist the attempted genocide was in Rwanda, which was not the first analysis, by the way, the first analysis of the genocidal violence in Rwanda, the first analysis, the first headlines, um, were not about sexual assault. That came, I know, 18 months later. But so 1325 was about participation, about analysis, um, about actually trying to think how women experience collective violence and that new understanding to be integral to any kind of peace agreement and any kind of post-peace um, rebuilding which means feminist analysis was supposed to be right there at the peace table and for years afterwards in the rebuilding of the society. This is what patriarchy does best. It takes it, people who are patriarchal, who have an investment, which can be a lot of men and some women, depending on what their careerist aspirations are. Right? Patriarchy wouldn't stand for a minute if some women didn't feel that they got rewards from it. And patriarchy is set up so that women feel rewarded by being the protected, by not taking feminist ideas seriously. You know, then you get to be the one who's reasonable and you're chosen for something. Um, and how patriarchy works and sustains itself is by taking a radical feminist idea and shrinking it down to something that is comfortable. So you take this radical idea about feminist analysis in peace accords and in rebuilding societies after conflict, and you shrink it down to adding more women to military forces, and maybe to the police force if you can kind of get them off into domestic violence, and just put them in that department. Um, and so, one thing I think we all have to do is watch the shrinkage process. And you can see it in all kinds of organizations, not just in the UN Security Council and the peacekeeping operations uh, side of the UN, UNPKO, but you can watch it in corporations, you can watch it in parliaments, you can watch it in development projects, things that were hard to get in, that new understandings, that are uncomfortable for the status quo and they're resisted. And then the resistors think, oh, we can live with this. If only we can shrink its meaning. We'll just turn it into a gender focal point. 
Does all of you know the gender? Have, you, have any of you ever been a gender focal point in a development project? Okay, here's what happens. So, first of all, gender focal points are resisted mightily. We don't need that. We already do it. What does main, ah, mainstreaming? We've already mainstreamed gender. We don't need a gender focal point in our, you know, water well digging project, right? Feminists inside the organization push for it, or the donors push for it. So then you've got to live with one. Well, here's what you do. You choose somebody who already has a full-time job in the organization. And then, this is how it works, by the way. And then you appoint them gender focal point. Oh, well, you already have a full-time job, but you can, just, you can just add this on. So almost all gender focal points are appointed amongst people who have full-time responsibilities. Secondly, you just appoint a woman. Any woman, that's okay. It doesn't matter, you never make sure that she gets the opportunity to learn gender analysis. You just appoint her. I mean, you know, most of us weren't born with gender analytical skills, right? So you appoint somebody whether or not they've ever had training and experience in this. So that's the second thing to make it comfortable for you. You, the head of the organization who never wanted a gender focal point anyway. Um, and then you make sure that they get almost no funding. And finally, you never invite them to the policy meeting. They hear of it afterwards, and then they're supposed to deal with it. And lo and behold, the thing you resisted is now totally comfortable. You don't have to change anything. And on your organizational chart, you have a gender focal point check. So to be taken seriously, I mean, I, in fact, the book before last, I called seriously because with a quick exclamation mark, because um, I really began to realize in all the organizations we work at, including academic organizations, but all kinds of development organizations, political or campaigning organizations, who's taken seriously is so political. And who gets to bestow seriousness on whom? Because serious, to be taken seriously is like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. You, I mean, you can work really hard to be taken seriously, and we all do, right? You think, I won't wear that to that meeting, right? I mean, you do all kinds of things to try and think, I want to be taken seriously today. You adjust your tone of voice. You try to use the language that at least for the first sentence will be heard before you actually move into language that's probably pretty unfamiliar to some of the people you're talking to. You do all kinds of things to be taken seriously, but you don't control it, right? And that notion of who is serious, and I think as far as strategies, I think, yes, you do have to try and think where the people you're trying to persuade are, and I don't think that, to, to try and think that, isn't meaning you're immediately selling your soul. Unless you give up too much for the sake of being taken seriously. And by the time you're further down the road, you've given up whatever was the innovative thing that you really wanted to persuade your colleagues of. So it takes a lot of kind of careful monitoring. But the other thing is, is to catch people when they're not taking it seriously. So like probably like most of you, I've spent, I don't, how many, how, how much, what proportion of our life pie do you think we've all spent in meetings? But meetings are really interesting, aren't they, right? If I were an anthropologist, I'd study meetings, <laughs> right? Um, and it took me a while um, to be able to catch people when they chuckled. And I'd say, Charlie, that actually isn't very funny. Or better, because it sounds a little more friendly. I mean, these are people you're going to meet for the rest of your life if you're in that organization. I'd say, Charlie, what's funny? Oh, and nothing. Not, uh, I mean, anything to catch people when they're, 
they're not just dismissing it for themselves, something that you've said. Or, so, or better yet, when your colleague has said something feminist. And you spot, especially if you've got any little bit more security in that organization than the person who just said it. Catch the rolling of the eyes. Catch the chuckle. Catch the shrug. So for instance, and that really is one of the ways to sort of break up this culture of not taking gender analysis and not taking feminist ideas seriously, is catch people when they think they're expressing collective ho-hum, collective dismissal. One of the things, these are all micro strategies, but sometimes at the moment they really matter. If you're gonna, if you know what's on the agenda for the meeting, and you know that you're gonna bring up something that is not gonna be very comfortable, say something to a colleague ahead of time and say, look, you, I'm gonna say something because I think we're really going down a very masculinized patriarchal, maybe even militarized path on, on this little, this project. Say something to somebody else that's going into the meeting with you and say, I'm going to say something in this meeting. You may not agree with it. Don't worry about that. But could you just make sure that the whole meeting pauses to consider what I'm going to say? So when I say something ahead of time, you have to, you know, script it ahead. Could, could you as just a good friend, colleague. Could you, when I say it, just say something to the effect of, oh, I hadn't thought about that before. Could we pause for a minute and have a discussion about that? Because otherwise what will happen is you or your good feminist colleague will say something and the person who's running the meeting will rush right ahead, right? Will rush right ahead and act as though you'd never said anything. And to get your good buddy, or you if you're the buddy, say, could we just have a bit of a discussion about that? That's something that I haven't thought about before. That can help break up that process. <sighs> Thank you. I think, we can, <laughs> I think we can all use that in our everyday life. So that's yeah. great tips. Thank you. I wanted to go back with, because we do see globally an increase of militarization and mm -hmm. also so in, in Sweden, and maybe emphasize a little bit more the, how you see that particular development is being militarized in the world today, if you have any examples, or um, and how you, you also said that it's very important to demilitarize it once you have militarized, yeah. but do you have any good uh, s um, examples of something that ha when it actually has worked or actually that you have demilitarized something? Yeah. Uh, the, in development work, the first clue that a lot of, I work with a lot of friends who are in development work um, in the Global South. And um, the first time they really got nervous and said, Cynthia, there's something going on. I'm not sure what it's going to do to our organization's work. And that was about the need for military convoy escorts. We're not going to be able to get our well digging equipment in unless we ask the local military um, or the local, the local militarized militia or the local state military um, for an escort. Which may seem totally reasonable and certainly you want to protect development people in the field. You don't want to put them at risk. Um, both local people and international people who are working on that project. But here is what one has, what my friends really say is really watch out. And this is about protector and protected. Because no matter what the actual gender is of the people who have accepted the convoy, they become feminized. Because now they are the protected. And they are protected by the military contingent that is the escort. And what friends tell me is that the escort, the military escort, more and more calls the shots. 
well, you can't really go there, you can't go there then, you can't call the village together to distribute what you've got. You have to play by our rules. You want us to be your protectors, your escort, then we get to say what's reasonable, what's doable, what's feasible, what's safe. And, set, and a lot of, be very interesting if any of you are doing also research, be interesting to interview several organizations about the consequences of accepting military escorts and what it's done to their projects. I've heard people say that really it's been very worrisome. So demilitarization is to actually bargain ahead of time with the escorts to say who gets to call what conditions. Not just to give up, you're the protector, you're there for the people who know, because that's about protector. We know the landscape, meaning the political landscape. Um, but ahead of time to set, look, we've got a mission here as development people, distributing whatever we're distributing, you know, medical care goods or food or equipment for um, agriculture. We've got a mission here and we have to get that mission done. It'll be a bargain. I mean, it won't, it won't be military escorts giving up their authority, their expertise, um, but at least bargain early to kind of hold back the militarization of your whole project because you've accepted escort. The second thing that one hears a lot, uh, Gabriella, is um, that whatever you're doing as a development effort becomes instrumentalized, all right? In English, in, I mean, you're all, your English is better than mine. You're, um, in, but instrumentalized means you can, and you can turn anything into somebody else's instrument, all right? That is, so you hear about food security, but food also becomes a bargaining chip or, any kind of aid that you're giving, fertilizer, can be turned into somebody else's um, instrument for control, right? For persuasion. And one has to, the only way to stop it is to recognize it as it's happening. Sometimes you're so eager to have access to a region, to people that you're willing to be an instrument of somebody else's policy, but be really careful. I, mean, it's, I think they're probably very hard calls, right? The access versus being turned into somebody else's instrument, right? And a lot of times, this is exactly what happens to women's access, to women's health, to women's voice. You can turn anything into a militarized instrument, anything. And the people who resist it oftentimes are the ones who then say, oh, oh yeah. So one of the current examples um, that happened first in Afghanistan, military forces that both under the UN uh, NATO command um, or under the Afghan uh, government's command, but especially under the NATO, i.e. US command, um, resisted having women in any kind of quote unquote combat roles, right? Just went against the grain. The one thing militaries around the world protect is this thing called combat. It's the last bastion of genuine masculinity, right? So combat's very fraught. I always put it in quotes because who knows who's in combat. So, but then some of the NATO forces, including the Americans, began to rethink it. And they began to assign women in uniform to these formerly combat roles. Why? Because, and, this, and the women who are doing it think they're doing a good job. One, they're breaking that gender barrier inside their own military, but the second is their assignment is to get information from the women. 
in the village. Well, it's not for the women's own improvement. It's because the military command has figured out, oh, that's a whole source of information that we haven't been able to get because our male uniform personnel can't go interview women in an Afghan village. Oh, but the, the women could. And if you listen to some of those women who've been assigned to those jobs, they think, and they're not being just puppets. I mean, they really, you know, because again, they have double incentives. They really do want to break down their own military's patriarchal system of assignment, but also they actually think they're giving the village women voice. But to whom? To NATO uniformed officers who are only playing out a role that the high command's intelligence um, authorities have assigned it. So again, beware of thinking that every breakthrough, in quotes, in what women do in a foreign military operation, including Afghanistan, definitely, um, is a feminist breakthrough. Who's instrumentalizing it for whom? And just that recognition, just that kind of saying, whoa, before we celebrate this, how are you going to use this? What are the women's voices? You know, when they talk to you in confidence, where are their words going? And to stop the celebration is actually one way to slow down militarization, I think. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open up for the floor. Um, just for, there's so much in there. There's also the, when, I, when you're talking, I'm thinking about also the way we use the word security. Oh. That could be a whole discussion on its own. Or the fact that foreign aid money now goes to military intervention. There, there's so much to to tap into, but I'm going to yeah. open for the floor. Uh, anyone has a question? Or a thought, or, or an th example, yeah. or an experience, or a puzzle. You know, there are all kinds of things to... It's early, but... Yeah, I know, <laughs> but you've had coffee, and, you know. Yeah. I mean, are you getting, mm -hmm. you know, those of you who are in some sort of training situation, are you getting gender analysis? Is this the kind of, you know, tools that you're being equipped with so that, you know, you're ready, able, and if not, how are people resisting? Because I think most people in here are students, most of you, right? And I, I mean, I studied 10 years ago, uh, but, and I studied international relations, and there was no gender course in my studies. I had to take that on the side. And like we talked about before, we, uh, uh, most people that took that course were women. Uh, so uh, as if gender were women, yeah, which so allows for the militarization of masculinities to go on rampantly without the guys who are being militarized having the skills. Again, skills you have to you have to acquire. It's not like in your DNA, right? It's that means that the guys who are being militarized oftentimes haven't had the training to see. Oh my God. Look, look what somebody's trying to do to me. Um, did I what say you, hand? What do you think? No. Come on, folks, you've got lots of ideas. Yes. Hi. Hi. So this maybe won't be very well thought through question, but... Um, now let's hear. Okay. Uh, I was wondering in terms of... Um, like we very often talk about demilitarization and masculinities and so on. And of course, that's really important to, sure. to focus on because maybe that's more dominant. But how could we work with trying to bring up feminization like, and encourage, um, I mean, not feminization. Sure, sure. It's, uh, that's a terminal, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but kind of instead of, uh, so I was recently in uh, in Uganda interviewing men and women about gender roles. And it struck me that very often people were always talking with women how they can be included more in masculine spheres. Yes. How could we work more with trying to include men in more 
traditionally feminine spheres right. and encourage men to be comfortable with taking on more traditionally feminine roles and, and attributes. Right. Uh, and what, what, how could that influence development? Because both have to happen. Yeah, right? exactly. And it seems like more focus is on the one side. Yes. Because um, that seems more progressive and there's more resistance. That is, women can work on construction sites or women should get, if tractors are being introduced, women should get training in running a tractor. Yes. Classic. Yeah. But not the other way. Yeah. And how, how would that, how do you think that that could and should play out in the development world and, and what could the outcomes be yeah. of that? I'll give you an example of, from Oxfam. I did a, um, of how it gets continued because nobody asks. I was doing a th thing with, um, at lunchtime, so it was very informal and people were sitting on window sills. It was, it was a lot of fun at Oxfam in, in Oxford in England several years ago. And so I asked them, what was the most masculinized part? Now this is Oxfam, right? So these are the, you know, these are the good people. Um, <laughs> but the people, the Oxfam woman who asked me to come knew that there were patriarchal streams within Oxfam in any organization. And so not know, because I didn't know Oxfam, I mean, I knew a little bit, but I didn't know Oxfam enough. And so I said, within Oxfam, what is the most masculinized um, department? And so it didn't actually take very long. Almost in unison, they said, oh, water, the water guys, because it's pipes, it, right? Because you have to be able to lay down pipes and it's kind of an engineering skill. You have to be able to get um, safe water into a refugee camp in Goma right, in Congo, really fast, right? And said, oh yeah. And then what they said is, I said, well, no, so then they got going, right? Because they were all field people, right? And they said, oh yeah, and what happens is our Oxfam water guys, the water guys, they come in and do this work, but they do like to get people who've just been turned into refugees involved in their work. You know, that is kind of one of the Oxfam good, you know, um, presumptuous, you get local people who've been turned into dependents, refugees, involved. So they learn new skills, but they also feel part of it. And said what they said, what we all do, and the water guys who were in the room said, yeah, 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 that is what we do. You ask the guys in the refugee camp to come help. They don't know anything about laying out down pipes. It's not like, oh, the refugee camp is full of recently displaced people who, and some of whom are really good with water pipes. I mean, that's not a skill that almost any of them have, but you teach them. And all of a sudden, there you've gone on and you've perpetuated the masculin masculinization, right? So that's the thing to break through. You want more women learning how to lay down water pipes, right? But then I asked, well, what is the most feminized part of Oxfam? And actually this took you could see them, it was great. You could kind of see the wheels turning, <laughs> right? And thinking about the different parts. And then finally a woman in the middle row said, peace education. And then once she said it, everybody in the room said, oh yeah, 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 peace education. It's not only that it was mainly women who did peace education, but peace education wasn't as urgent as water, all right? So also peace education is a thing that, well, you do it if you can, right? But it's not as important as getting those pipes down at the Goma refugee camp. And it was the urgency, urgency plus technicality plus supposedly, well, kind of mud, you know, being down in the hard work that combined to make for masculinization. And peace education, which we all know is really hard to do effectively. It is really hard work. It takes a lot of skill. That didn't have urgency, technicality, and mud, and therefore was feminized. And to get guys in Oxfam to imagine that actually peace education is urgent, 
It is urgent. It is difficult. It does take skill. And therefore, it is something that they don't lose any of their status as manly men to become really good peace educators. Um, that was the hard, hard thing to do. And I think from friends of mine who do this work, um, women, is it women peacemakers? Isabel Geskins in The Hague. Women peacemakers, I think. Um, in The Hague, which is a very good NGO in, in the Netherlands and does a lot of work in Burundi and other places. They said, really, they work very hard to try and make boys, as well as men, realize that they are being fitted for a very narrow shoe. That masculinity in most societies, as much as it may be different from Uganda than it is in Mali, and Mali than it is in Cambodia, right? or Sweden, or the US, that it is a deliberately narrow shoe. And that boys and men are being squeezed into a shoe. It is not liberating to fit the conventional, local, masculine model. It is not liberating. It may feel as though you've got status, but you don't have freedom. And that to take on these very difficult roles like childcare, I mean, is there anything more difficult, really? You know, not to mention exhausting. Um, to take on and learn the skills for expanded roles actually gets you out of the tight-fitting, pinching shoe. That's hard work to do. But it is one of the ways that friends of mine who do it say that you can really posit it, not just do it so that you can be a more feminist friendly man, which would be great if that were their main motivation. But it's mainly get out of this prison somebody else has built for you and realize you can do, it's not one or the other, you can do a number of different things. But it is hard. A problem, a risk, and you probably are all very familiar with this. Now we're talking about donors. Donors are, and you all are going to be in, you're probably now in, or you're about to be working in, organizations that have to think about donors. You always have to think about donors. Men and boys and masculinity is the new donor flavor of the, not the month, the last three years. Four years? All right? Donors love it. Which then reprivileges working with men and boys. Um, and so you have to really watch donors, right? Because they will sometimes, they'll do two things. One, they'll pull you off course of the thing that you really think needs to be done. But the second thing is that you'll take whatever you're doing and try to reframe it because you constantly have to get money. You'll try to reframe it so it fits their new flavor. Um, and the men and boys and masculinity thing has been a big challenge for a lot of feminist-informed peace groups. Um, Wilf hasn't gone that way. We have not, but we do feel the pressure. The, the, well, we feel that it's the the pot of money that is out there uh, for women organizations have not increased with this. It has more taken money mm. away from women organizations and saying, well, now we're going to fund this instead. And of course, it's important to talk about men and boys and, and masculinities. Time. But the problem is when you do that instead mm. of uh, giving money to women's organizations as well, you should do both. There should be more money added to that so everything can be, yeah. can be done. Yeah, yeah. But, but donor, and, together. and if, again, if you're looking for a research project, watch the donors. Right? There's more and more talk now amongst um, civic organizations um, and um, NGOs about, I mean, the good thing is there's more real talk now about donors. Um, and donors usually depend on donors, right? I mean, the Ford Foundation doesn't just have money, they raise money. So donors, um, I, mean, I don't think the Gates Foundation has to raise money. 
I mean, I, you know, I mean, really, I'm trying to think of, there, there are not many organizations that look like they're the big donors. Yeah. Just, but just a question to that as well. Do I need, do I need the mic? Yeah, just for the, the recording. For the yeah, recording, okay. yeah. Uh, my name is Maria, Maria Bard, and I work for an Hi. NGO. Hi. Uh, but it's just a question, because I find donors being very interesting, but also the connection to the media, what yes. the media is raising, because what we're seeing quite a lot is if, you know, if you're working in an international humanitarian context, if the media light is ever somewhere, the donors will also go there. And oh, that, for I example, see. the Congo is an example yeah. of that, a very specific example. But how do you think, uh, like that, that wow. connection, and when it comes to the focus on, on men and masculinity, when it comes to this issue, how do you deal with, what do you think of the media's role in that, in connection wow. to the donors? Again, I think it's a lot in the eyes of editors and publishers or producers and what they think is serious. Again, it, it's, so one of the things, you know, would be, this would be really interesting. Always interesting to dream up things for you to do. That I, you know, <laughs> um, and that is to bring together um, feminist informed, that would be you, feminist informed um, humanitarian and development um, people with journalists and have this discussion. Now, a lot of journalists will tell you, I go where my editor sends me. But oftentimes, journalists sell stories to, to editors. I mean, that, there's a pro, I mean, you know this, there's a process inside of um, a television station or a, uh, a radio station or a newspaper of it's, it's the on the ground journalist has to sell their story up the chain to get authorization to spend the next week studying this. But it would be really interesting to have a genuine conversation between, start with journalists, not their editors. No editors in the room, please, mm -hmm. right? Because then you'll get more candor about how, what's taken seriously, what's hard to do, what's not considered. The other <coughs> thing is there's the ideology of the story. And what you'll hear an editor say is, well, that's not really a story. There's no hook, as they say in media. Um, and then you can cut, because it'd be good for you to hear what are their problems of selling a story or covering a story or um, getting evidence to make it a credible story. We're talking about serious journalists now where they need evidence. Um, but also for them to hear you about God, we do so much interesting work that is so difficult, and yet we don't seem to ever get any media coverage. Could you tell, I mean, let's have an exchange here about why that doesn't look like a story, or why, oh, I could never sell that to my editor, right? Or you got in there, but I would never get the, because they have to have insurance, I'd never get the insurance my newspaper will never pay the insurance to go to that part of Congo or, you know, not to mention South Sudan. But it'd be really interesting to have a kind of on the ground, we're all in this together kind of conversation with media people, both freelancers and people working for larger organizations here in, in Sweden. And just to trade, because I think you're quite right. I think donors oftentimes, they catch a media story and then their attention switches because donors want to be kind of where the action is. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there's this language that we all use. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much. It's always so inspiring and so educational to listen to you. Oh, it's a dear. privilege. <laughs> um, my name is Jenny. I, I'm a gender advisor at an NGO. Ah. Um, it, there was something you said that really struck a chord with me, which was this thing about how radical ideas, radical feminist ideas yeah. get captured, get de-radicalized, de-politicized, yeah. and then people run with yep. them. You know? So I think there's a, I, often we find ourselves caught in a kind of be careful what you wish for yes. situation where yeah, we work yeah. so hard for things to be picked up, whether it's gender mainstreaming, mm -hmm. 1325, mm -hmm. or the need to examine masculinities. And then when they do get picked up, when we get traction for those ideas, that's actually where the critical moment exactly. is, right? Because that's where it kind of 
goes out of our hands and, and Can you give an example is from your own experience? Can I give you five hundred yeah. examples. <laughs> no, I can't I can't think of one in particular. But yeah. I think in, in the happens. sector in general as well as on a yeah. kind of uh, micro level. And I just wanted to know if you had any tips for what do we do then? When people finally say, Yeah, this is a good idea and you see it morphing into shrinking, yeah. like you said, into something quite different from what it was intended to be. I mean, I don't have you know in militarized terms, I don't have a magic bullet, but we don't use that language anymore, do we? No. Um, I don't have kind of a single answer, but one of the things that strikes me from talking with people doing the kind of hard work you're doing inside of organizations is to make sure you've got kind of a critical mass, which may be five people, it may not be 35 people in the organization, but you have a critical mass of people who really get what this new innovation is and will monitor it and will stay organized to press the head honchos who are in the shrinkage mode um, so that you're, you've got some kind of, if you will, internal campaign to, to watch the shrinkage to challenge it, to say that's not what we all agreed to. Um, and because I think what oftentimes happens is they think that you, as the gender advisor, you're going to be it. Well, you can't do everything, right? And also, it's oftentimes harder to get senior managers to pay attention if it's just you who always say, you know, that's, it's broader than that. If, if it's five or six or maybe even 12 of you who really were in favor of that innovation and will stay organized, maybe even call yourself a group, you know, inside for that innovation, that sometimes can give pause to senior management in their shrinkage mode. So I think what happens, because everybody in order, these organizations are all overworked, right? Everyone's wearing six hats. Um, it's really hard to kind of, once you've got an innovation through, which itself is an achievement, it's hard to kind of stay mobilized because, oh my God, now you're on to the other thing, right? But if you, if you can have at least a handful of you who really worked for this innovation and stay mobilized, meaning stay attentive, to be mobilized means attentive, right? To stay attentive so that you can say, no, no, that's actually much narrower than what we all just agreed to. It's not, you know, not to mention if you can get anybody outside that you're working with, that your organization is working with, to have a stake in the full innovation, not the shrunken version of it. And because sometimes people outside have more access and are taken, quote, more seriously by senior managers, the shrinkers, um, than you might. So those are two things, just to build that kind of cross. I know, it's easier said than done. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, hi. Well, I'm not sure if it's a question, but um, hello. Hi, hi, yeah, yeah let's hear. <laughs> okay, well, my name is Melissa, and um, hi, I am Melissa. a student, or, well, sort of, about to finish my studies um, and I study international relations yes oh and um, <laughs> you're brave <laughs> <laughs> yes and uh, one thing at first I just want to share a little bit about my experience one thing I've realized is that um, throughout our whole like three four years of studies um, we've had very little gender um, like oh courses if I should say that we don't really have any course specifically on gender actually you get a week yeah about that yeah. Um, obviously, we have all these like different IR issues that we go into, but then when it comes to the gender, they will add that like one seminar on gender, but then thousands on like power and yeah. all yeah, other yeah. stuff, security and all other like typical um, IR matters. And so I, I don't know, somehow I just feel it's like so unfair for us who are actually interested in writing about gender yeah. issues, because when it came to the, uh, the point of writing my bachelor thesis, I got a lot of uh, opposition from my professors, oh not boy. except one, who's a gender scholar, obviously. <laughs> yeah. So she was very encouraged, and she actually said that she would be my um, 
supervisor. Yeah, yeah. so that was the hard good. thing is to find the supervisor, right? Yeah, but at least we have her, but she's yeah. the only one at our department. So but every other person, um, every other professor that I was trying to speak about this, like the, my yeah. topic before, they were very um, like resistant. And someone was telling me, no, you're going out of the topic. This is not IR related. This is not topic. IR related. And I, was, and I was trying to like discuss with this professor and telling him, but these are all the articles I found and these are in IR journals. These are IR related. Like there is a whole subfield of feminist yeah. IR scholarship. But I mean, okay, so that I just want to share that. First of all, it's very hard even when you're it trying is. to because oh, they're so res hard. like resistant. That's yeah. one thing. Um, and also, they, they talk about the narrow shoe of masculinity. Within the narrow shoe of mas masculinity is the toe of masculinized IR mm -hmm. that is just pinched, right? And so your yeah. professors say that's not IR. Oh, please. That, that's what the others said, except the one who is a gender scholar. Yeah, so course. she was really yeah, pushing yeah, forward, she, like, you should really do this. So yeah. I ended up doing a field study, actually, in Tanzania, ah, um, right. looking into NGOs, which also, that was also another debate because... I mean, there are different, obviously, actors in international yeah. relations, but mostly, like, at our department, they want us to focus on states oh, or man. institutions, um, and I'm more interested in NGOs, yeah. <laughs> so that was also another actors. issue for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> because, well, first of all, NGOs are not, like, they don't want us to get into that topic, it seems. And then, because I was doing feminist IR, so that was <laughs> both a very bad combination. <laughs> but anyways, um, once I went to Tanzania, it was very interesting, because I was looking into, like, um, NGOs perceptions of like gender mainstreaming ah, and mm -hmm. if it works or not basically yeah, sure. <laughs> in Tanzania but one thing that I noticed um, speaking to the people who the NGOs that usually go and train um, the staff of the um, what is it the politicians in yeah. Tanzanian government yeah um, they were saying that yeah we're trying to I don't know if they're getting it mm -hmm. <laughs> because it seemed that one uh, also I just thought about it when you were um, speaking about this being a gender focal point in the organization. Yeah. So I was just, um, I just wanted to mention it because one thing I saw was that, so these NGOs would go there and train mm -hmm. the politicians, but then they would like, when it comes to like gender mainstreaming, though they have it in paper, they mostly ref refer it to like, oh, but that's, that's for the gender um, <gasps> department wow, yeah. or that's for the gender minister. And like, there's no ownership of that. That's right. Even though like it is there on paper, like they have a gendered budget, question marks, but yeah, <laughs> right, right. Um, but then like no one actually takes it serious and then I don't know, somehow I'm just trying to understand, like, how can you... I understand that Tanzania, obviously, is a very patriarchal country, like, if you look yeah, into so the structure. Yeah, but so is every other country. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just trying to understand. It was a bit um, frustrating for me to see that... Um, so you have these all things, like, very beautifully written on paper, yeah. but then it's not really happening in practice. And it's not just because of... Tanzania being a country whose institutions is not as strong as Sweden and such, mm -hmm. but it was actually, like, a more like deeply rooted within the people who are supposed to implement it, they don't even understand gender themselves. No. So, so that's the issue. Well, uh, but the thing is, that is, for, for your dissertation, that is your finding. I mean, that is a finding. It's, for you, who's a feminist, it's a frustrating finding. But it is a finding, right? Don't let anyone tell you that, oh, you didn't find what you set out to find. Because, in fact, you found how gender mainstreaming is dismissed, how it's marginalized, how this globalized language of um, international aid, right, and development, how, what is, how does it get implemented on the ground in a way that doesn't have anything to do with the larger mandate and mission. And I think that, that is what you found with the NGOs and their relationships to the politicians in Tanzania, that's really interesting. I don't know of anyone else who's actually written about that. I have friends who talk about it, but because, you know, it's so frustrating. But I've never seen anyone writ write about it. Well, and so it's very hard to find anything related to Well, but it's because it's because you're doing something innovative. You know, this is called doing really innovative research. And so don't for, I mean, don't for a moment think that what you found is a non-finding. It is a finding, and it's a finding that people talk about over coffee, very strong coffee, <laughs> um, maybe Tanzanian coffee, um, but they don't write about 
in a formal kind of way the way you're going to write about it. Um, but it is also true in academia. IR is one of the IR and economics. Well, economics is so difficult. I mean, as a discipline. Um, but they are amongst the last bastions. But there is the Journal of Feminist Economics. Do you all know the Journal of Feminist Economics? Um, and within IR, there is the, um, um, the feminist the journal. The feminist, yeah, and we all created that journal precisely to have a kind of physical um, evidence that um, feminist IR scholarship exists, it is real, big publishers, that's Francis and Taylor, a big British pub, publish it, it's a refereed, oh, it's a refereed journal, see we're trying to be taken seriously. Um, but, but that's one of the reasons we all decided, there are about 20 of us I guess, decided to, because it's, you know, it's all unpaid work to put out a journal. I mean, you all may think that academic journals are mainly powerful gatekeepers. Actually, it's just all unpaid work that everybody does because they care about. And if I can just put a footnote here, think about actually subscribing to International Feminist Journal of Politics or any other feminist journal. Think about actually being a subscriber, and here's why. Because when you find the articles, and we all do this, you know, you're trying to be efficient, you cherry pick the articles, but when you get the whole issue, you hear the editors saying why they put the issue together the way they did. You get to see, well, who's on the advisory board, right? How broad a range of countries and disciplines or, you know, interests are there? And you get to have a feeling that you're actually reading something that a group of really living, breathing women and some good men um, created. It's a really different thing to get a journal. I, don't, I mean, don't stop your cherry picking, you know, that's what you have to do. But think of it, because they're all student rates too. Get, um, get at least, uh, subscribe to at least one or two honest to God, living, breathing, hard copy journals. Because it really gives you a sense that you're part of a community, a community that's creating this, right? And that just gives you a different feeling. It also says you can, wave the real issue in front of the mentor, you know. Uh, which... <laughs> Last question, and I think we'll Oh, gosh, how do you... Yeah. Okay, oh, um, I talk too thank much. you very much. Um, I would like to ask you about the, um, I don't know, like the, um, I mean, we have, we have pat patriarchy, but we also have like uh, several power orders and how to, how oh. to include those in the gender analysis, basically. Um, right. I'm thinking about gender mainstreaming yeah. um, as a particular example where we have um, this gender strategy that somehow taps into maybe new public management and, and ah, right. things like that. So how do we address the uh, gender and also a multitude of, of power orders? Yeah. I, I think over the years, this is why I do a lot of political economy, even though, as Gabriella said, I spend a lot of my waking, sometimes my sleeping hours, that's bad news, um, uh, thinking about militarization and the relationship of patriarchy. And I use patriarchy a lot. It's a much bigger, it's a power order, right? It's not just sexism, right? Sexism is part of patriarchy, misogyny is part of patriarchy, but patriarchy is the big power system um, with people. It's not abstract. Um, but I spent a lot of time actually working on political economy. That's why I spent a lot of time thinking about um, the garment industry. I spent a lot of time thinking about the banana industry, the big uh, plantation products, you know, because I want to understand the extent to which neoliberal capitalist globalized workings. Um, in fact, how much they depend on gender, right? And it doesn't, I guess, here's, I don't start, a, let's say I'm now trying to get a better handle on the international coffee economy, right? Um, I don't start with the assumption that gender explains everything or that the coffee eco political economy in 2017 is totally explained 
by patriarchal workings. What I tend, and I, I, over the years I've tried to craft and then recraft and then recraft the question I'm asking. Right? I try to ask, in what ways and under what conditions are patriarchal power systems explaining how the international coffee system works? Because that allows me to say under what conditions and in what ways. It doesn't mean I start my investigation saying patriarchal workings is going to explain everything I need to know about the coffee system. Right. Um, but it does mean I at least have it right in the forefront of my mind. Because a lot of people who work on international political economy, and if you're doing development or humanitarian work, you are working on international political economies, right? Um, foreign investment and plantations and, um, and banks. Um, a lot of people who work on globalized political economy always prioritize neoliberalism, neoliberal capitalism, as if it explains everything. And then underneath that, if you're interested, you can watch the gender dynamics at work. But I, I pose the question more in terms, under what conditions actually are gender, usually patriarchally organized, gender relations controlling other things? And if you take the garment industry, for instance, and you leave out femi feminization, that is turning something into a feminized job so you can pay it poorly. Never say cheap labor. You'd never say cheap labor, would you? You say labor made cheap. That's really different. If you didn't understand the workings of feminization, you couldn't explain jeans. You couldn't explain anything we're wearing today, right? So to ask the question so that you, you can find whatever you're going to find, and you might be surprised, but you don't say, okay, it's neoliberal capitalism, then I wonder where gender is. Because that then allows all the people, including your people in IR, allows them to um, just push off gender analysis to somebody down the hall who's on a temporary contract usually. Um, it says, no, no, if you don't have gender analytical skills, you're not even going to be able to begin to understand how the international political economy works, by the way, including banking. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Oh, wow. Well. Uh, it's a great start of the day. Let's yeah. go change the world. <laughs> yeah. coming. Uh, it was great. And now it's on to Cipri where we're, there's the beginnings of a feminist, there's the beginnings of feminist research inside of Cipri. <laughs> <laughs>